and coming in this morning. I think Keith is to be complimented on choosing this topic for early morning consumption. I think he envisions it as kind of an early morning accompaniment to the hair of the dog that no. you <laughs> at the party last right. night. Or after talking to somebody this morning, maybe I should say the hair of the bomb that bit you last night. <laughs> well, this is an attack dog kind of talk. So I want to talk about three things that I think are important to our attacks on dogs and their handlers. Cross-examining to attack the foundation for dog alerts in warrantless cases. Attacking warranted cases and falsehoods or omissions about dog alerts in affidavits for search warrants. And obtaining the dog records necessary to make the attacks on cross-examination. Now let's start with maybe something a little more concrete. Your client, Mr. Cole Kane, has been stopped on Interstate 70 for a traffic violation. The law enforcement officer, the trooper, interviews the driver who says that he and the passenger are on their way to New York City. Unfortunately, the passenger says they're on their way to San Francisco. Based upon that ambiguity, the patrolman just happens, even though he's on routine traffic patrol, to have insidiously coiled in the back seat of his law enforcement vehicle, Winka the Wonder Dog. Yeah. So he gets Winka out, leads Winka around Mr. Kane's car, and based on some hysterical response, of Winka to the trunk of Mr. Kane's car, he elects to search the trunk, and within he finds a suitcase that, when opened, contains $40,000 in United States currency. Well, as a result of that, he also locates the baggage tag on the bag that lists Mr. Kane's Aspen, Colorado condominium. What happens then? Then he seeks a search warrant for drug records in order to search the Aspen condo. In the affidavit for the search warrant, the trooper represents that Winka the Wonder Dog is a trained and certified narcotics detection dog who alert, alerts to the presence of marijuana and cocaine with 98% reliability. Of course, the search warrant is executed at the Aspen condo, and therein they find the 40 kilos of cocaine. Well, in that case, what is one of the first attacks we're going to consider making on this search? It isn't it that we're going to contend that the warrantless search of the trunk based only on the dog's alert is illegal? A couple good reasons to start there. Number one, United States versus Leon and the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule won't inoculate a warrantless search. And usually the prosecutor in most jurisdictions has the burden of production and the burden of proof on a warrantless search. So how's the prosecutor going to bear his or her burden of proof on demonstrating the legitimacy of this warrantless search? Let's say the prosecutor puts on the trooper and the trooper says, well, on the day in question, I determined that the driver and the passenger gave inconsistent designations of their destination. Based on that, I elected to run my German Shepherd, Wink of the dog, Wonder Dog, around the car, and when she barked at the trunk, I knew there to be dangerous contraband therein. So I searched the trunk. Well, if, if, if the cop puts on that kind of foundation, is that enough? Probably not. I mean, from that foundation, all we know is that this is the patrolman's lap dog who's doing nothing more than alerting on the salami in a picnic basket in the trunk. Actually, in Kansas, they like to make sure that their attorneys can remember the holdings of cases based really just on the name of the case itself. So in Kansas, the case that tells us that there has to be some foundation to prove the legitimacy of the dog's alert is aptly styled 
Steak versus Barker. <laughs> in that case, it says that in order to miraculously, my laser pointer doesn't seem to be working today. If anybody has one, I'd borrow it from them. Anyway, it says in order to establish probable cause for the search of the vehicle, some foundation testimony is necessary to establish that the alert of the dog provided probable cause for the search of the vehicle. Obviously, a description of the dog's conduct, training, and experience by a knowledgeable person who can interpret the conduct of the dog as signaling the presence of a controlled substance would constitute the minimum requirement for finding probable cause. Well, so what if the prosecutor then puts on the dog handler and the dog handler says, well, on the day in question, I was a certified dog handler, certified by the North American Police Work Dog Association. I had been trained by the North American Police Work Dog Association along with my dog, Wink of the Wonder Dog, who was trained, certified, and recertified as a narcotics detection dog who could reliably detect the presence of cocaine by an aggressive final response of barking and pawing at the target odor and that wink of the wonder dog reliably alerts 98% of the time to the presence of marijuana or cocaine. Well, if they put on that kind of foundation, is that enough? Probably is. Most courts hold that the alert of a trained and certified narcotics detection dog is sufficient to establish probable cause. So if they put on that kind of testimony, what are we going to do? Roll over and play dead? No, we're going to cross-examine, either by a voir dire cross-examination before the handler states his opinion as to the reliability of the dog's indication or alert, or on a straight cross-examination.